Okay, so building the fire. Um, I usually like starting with a couple of medium sized pieces, about three to four inches in diameter. Um, we'll put, if you can, on your stove, if you can put them in depth wise, it's usually better for starting a fire. Some stoves aren't deep enough to fit the wood in that way, so then you have to start it uh, crossways. Um, I did a video on that at home the other night. But I need to go grab some paper. Any of the uh, liberating gutters that I have in this blue bag and it's full of paper and cardboard and stuff like that, just scrap paper. Um, so, um, does anyone know why? We use kind of medium sized pieces of wood on either side like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Any other reasons? Mm -hmm. It'll develop holes quicker. Um, anything else? <laughs> yeah. The heat radiates back and forth off the two pieces. Right, making it yeah, kind of like retains all that energy right where you want it to be. So instead of having that heat reflection be off the sides of the units, you're bringing in a little bit, so you get a little bit more of a hot pocket and and a little hot spot closer in. So. Um, I like to use a lot of paper and a lot of cleaning to get things started up real quick. Uh, I usually will fill the whole space between the two pieces of, of wood um, with paper. Uh, scrap paper, newspaper, anything that isn't heavily inked. If it has a lot of ink on it, um, particularly colored ink, or if it's glossy, could be burning in there. Obviously, you want to avoid stuff that has any plastic on it, too. Um, if your unit has a catalytic converter in it, which this unit does, um, any of those heavy ink papers, colored ink papers, um, glossy paper, uh, any plastic like that could actually do damage to the catalytic converter. So it's important not to burn that stuff. And it's also just bad for the environment too, all that chemicals and whatnot. Uh, but scrap paper, actually brown paper bags, like grocery bags are the best. I love those because it's a denser, denser paper. Uh, works really well. Yeah. Egg cartons work good. Uh, a lot of times you can take egg cartons or like toilet paper rolls or paper towel rolls and fill them with dryer lint. Those work really great. Um, so, yeah, so we'll get kind of the bottom filled up with paper, kind of like so. Uh, you can use a cardboard. Um, Try and use clean cardboard. Brown stuff is best. Brown or white stuff is best. Same concept with paper. You don't want to use anything that is glossy, like like a lot of kitchen cardboard, like cereal boxes and things like that. You typically don't want to use in a stove like this. They're covered in wax. So, um, huh? Because they're covered in wax. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And again, all that heavy ink stuff is not great for it. Okay. So then, once we get all our paper in there, the next thing is we want. <coughs> Uh, as fine a kindling as you can get to start with, the finer it is, the easier it'll take off. Um, if you're going to use cardboard, uh, you can take the cardboard and rip it up into little pieces. You don't want pieces that are too big because, um, especially if you don't have enough paper in there, it can actually cause it to not start as easily because with a fire, you want a lot of airflow. The more airflow you've got, the quicker things will take off, right? So if you take a big old piece of cardboard and put it on all top, all that paper, it's not going to get as much airflow if it was a bunch of little pieces. I'm going to start this fire without cardboard. Um, but anyway, so find kindling, grab a handful, start with the smaller pieces. Um, a lot of times what I will do is get about three or four kind of positioned going front to back. And then what we'll do is we can start just layering them in a crisscross pattern. Again, three or four, depending on how big your stove is. Um, and you get two or three layers of the, of the thin stuff, and then we take some of our bigger kindling and 
start putting that on top, following that criss crisscross pattern, and just slowly get it bigger and bigger until we fill up the firebox. That's what I'm gonna get. I might be able to get. No, I'm not gonna get one of those in there, which is okay. Okay. Yeah, you want to get as much wood in there to start with as you can. Mm -hmm. So, uh, the reason being is one, you won't have to tend it as much in the beginning. Two, you'll develop coals quicker because then you've got wood in there that's breaking down uh, faster with, with the initial ignition of, of the fire. Um, so, yeah, all right, so we got that in there. Um, I assume everyone knows why you want to crisscross your kindling and have spacing of a couple of inches, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Airflow. Airflow, right, okay, good. Before we light this thing off, there's a couple things we want to check. You always want to make sure your ash pan is closed, the door is secured and closed. Um, if your unit has a bypass damper, which this particular unit does, this, this is a Kuma model Tamarack, uh, which has a catalytic converter in it and a bypass damper. On these Kumas, on any of the uh, 2020 or newer uh, Kumas, they're called LEs, um, the, they have bypass dampers and all you got to do is just pull it forward and down about three quarters of an inch It's a very small adjustment uh, It has a lot of throw on it like you can really pull it far out But you certainly don't need to do that. There's like a little catch and you just pull it forward and down About three quarters of an inch it catches and that's in the open position your air control your air supply is down here Pulled out to the right is in the fully open position pushed all the way to the left is in your closed position you want to start with that all the way open. I'm going to use matches um, just so I'm not cheating there. Um, like in that specific bypass damper yeah, seems to be like a really big like learning curve for a lot of clients too. They don't understand that just small movements and then touch. They're just like ripping on it, trying to get it to open yep. all the way. Yeah. So yeah, that is a big... Even if you show them like it's just a little mm -hmm. thing, they usually grab it and just go. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yep, yep. Yeah, so I like to, yeah, when I'm doing a demonstration on the stove after we installed it or if we're having problems with it, I like to make sure that they're the ones operating it while <coughs> I'm there and guide them and just say, hey, no, just a little bit. You just got to pull it forward a little bit, mm -hmm. pull down, and once they feel it a couple times, then you get the hang of it. But I like to do that when I'm there with them. Uh, we had one guy that thought it was broken because they'd be pulling it out and it wasn't hooking or anything like that. Well, we had two people, that was Dave and then the guy from, uh, yeah, anyways. So, okay, We're good to go ahead and light this thing off. I usually like to light the paper in as many spots as I can just to get flame going. <clears throat> Then we can go ahead and crack the door. Um, now, if you look at the door, see how this has like a little curve to it, a little elbow in it. So what you can do is you can actually hook that over just inside this, this opening here. And, and so that way it won't actually pop open. So it's kind of, um, that's by design actually. Um, Whenever you're leaving the door cracked on a stove, you never really want to leave it unattended. It's okay to, you know, go in the room and come back for a minute, but you don't want to start a fire with the door open and then, like, go outside and spend a half hour working out there or go about your day. You want to be aware of what's going on. Um, with the door open, you're getting extra airflow in there, and you could, you could, the fire could just go out because of that extra, extra heat if you have enough wood in there. It could actually overheat the stove, you know, with that extra airflow and so on and so forth. And then in a situation maybe where the door's cracked and it, and it doesn't have a catch like this particular unit does, um, something could roll forward and kick the door open and then you could have a, have a hot burning log roll out of your stove. So it's you important. It where, like the fire starts taking off and it creates like a little suction through there. So it starts sucking the door and then all of a sudden it just pops open. Right. So, um... So anyways, we can leave that door open for five, 10, sometimes even 15 minutes. Different stoves take a little bit longer to kind of really get the fire going. Um, some big factors are how well did you build the fire? How dry is the wood? 
uh, how much draft you have in the system. Like, is it the right size? Is it is it tall enough, or is it you know the taller the pipe, the more suction you're going to get in the system. Um, but really, what we're looking for is we're looking for this bigger wood up top, and well, for all that wood to really start kind of getting engulfed in flame before we close the door. If it's a situation where we close the door and the fire really kind of shrinks and dies down and it loses some of that um, intensity, open the door back up, let it kind of get going a little bit further. We lost a little bit, I might give it another minute or two um, just to kind of catch a little bit more. Um, now, the idea with this, the first 10 to 15 minutes, I spend a lot of time working with this fire, trying to get it going. As these smaller pieces start burning up really quickly, the bigger ones are going to start kind of dropping down. And once we start kind of developing coals in there, we're going to reach in there and we're going to move things around and continually get things into that, that onto the floor of the firebox. Um, that will that'll help get those coals going a lot faster as well. It'll also create room on top to start adding more wood in there. And we're going to continue the trend with building the pieces of the size of the wood up. Um, if you start a fire with pieces of wood that are too big, um, like Dan there, you have some really big sized pieces of log, uh, pieces of wood, um, it'll take too much energy out of the fire and it'll actually slow the process down. The reason being is because of the surface area. Okay, so there's three stages to um, fire. Uh, does anyone know what those three stages are? Or, well, there's, if we're talking about like literal definitions, there's the dry, mm -hmm. uh, seralis, right? So, pyrolysis. 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 Yeah, yeah. <laughs> then there's charcoal. Right? You got it. Yep, yep. So, drying, pyrolysis, charcoaling. Does anyone know the definition of pyrolysis? It's where the. It gets to a certain temperature that it uh, basically changes chemistry. It'll start producing. It's, yeah, so it's the chemical breakdown by heat, right? So it, it gets to a point where that wood, is, is, as you were just saying, gets hot enough that it starts uh, changing on a molecular level and starts breaking the, down. The wood's not burning itself, it's the molecules coming off gassing is what's burning. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep, it's the hydrocarbons and all that kind of stuff, right? So, um, so that first stage, the drying process, uh, the bigger the wood, the bigger the surface area you're starting with, the more drying you're going to have to do before you actually get into the pyrolysis stage. The goal is to get into that pyrolysis, py pyrolysis stage as fast as possible. So that's why we tend to use smaller pieces for starting, right? Um, the, the other thing about that too is if your wood uh, is too wet, if you've got too much moisture in the wood, that drying stage takes a lot longer too, you know, and it also requires a lot more energy and it requires a lot more heat. So when you're starting a fire with, with wood that uh, isn't dry enough or it has too much moisture, it can be harder to start, take a lot longer, require maybe leaving the door open for a longer period of time. It's going to need more oxygen. It's going to need more heat to really uh, reach that paralysis stage. So, we're getting to the point where we have enough room in there. I could probably move a little thing, a couple things around, get some more of these smaller pieces in there. <clears throat> so the other thing to think about too is like, I, I don't think we're ready to get one of those bigger pieces of wood in there. And the reason being is we got, we got some coals going down in there, but we really want all of this small wood to turn into coals first. Because again, what, what'll happen is if we take a nice big piece of wood and throw it in a fire that doesn't have a good enough coal base, it's just gonna zap all the energy out of that fire to go into that drying process because of that big old piece and all that surface area. So um, again, this is something to really, to maximize the performance and to get things up to temperature at a rapid rate, it takes some work and some attention to build it up gradually. Um, but if you do it, you're gonna have a really strong coal base um, at a fairly rapid rate. You're gonna get your catalytic converter up to temp fairly quickly. You're gonna get your, your flue temps up to temperature quickly and be able to heat the home a lot quicker as well.
Now, different types of stoves will take a lot longer. In general, uh, any kind of steel, plate steel stove, which this is, um, will take a lot less time to get up to temperature because there's less mass to heat up. Um, but stoves like cast iron stoves, uh, cast iron stoves and soapstone stoves, which we have some here that I can show you, um, they take a lot longer because there's more mass. So like some of these soapstone stoves that you see over here, kind of the ornate, you know, uh, stone ones, those can take up to two hours to get up to temperature. Uh, whereas a steel stove, 20, 30 minutes is typically all you need. So, um, so you can see when I move things around and I, and I put in those new pieces, the fire kind of died down a little bit. We lost some of its vigor. I think that's for two reasons. One, um, maybe those, those kind of bigger pieces on top hadn't quite caught enough. Um, I think a big reason is this wood actually is a little bit wetter than it should be. So it's not as dry as, as we would like it. Um, all right, so we're gonna let that, that new wood I just put in there catch a little bit. I'm gonna leave the door cracked just to kind of help get it going a little bit more. Um, and once it starts getting going, we'll go ahead and close that door again. Um, any stove that has a catalytic converter in it, um, you have to give it enough time to get up to temperature before you start shutting things down. Uh, a lot of people will start shutting things down right away. Um, you know, as soon as they have flame, they'll go ahead and start closing their dampers and their air controls and things like that. Um, and, I, and I think the concept is to try and save on uh, fuel. You know, they don't want their fuel to burn up too quickly. Um, the problem is, is that if we never get things up to temperature, it causes a whole host of problems. One, it drastically affects the performance and efficiency of the unit. So it actually won't burn your wood as thoroughly. You won't get as long of a burn time out of it. And you're also gonna have a lot more emissions that way too. Um, so when we're talking about soot and creosote in a chimney system, um, it's all based off of temperature. So you're gonna have more buildup in your chimney and in your flue if your flue temperatures are lower, right? So if you don't ever get those temperatures high, you're always gonna be low on that, running at a lower temperature and you're gonna produce a lot more creosote at a very fast rate. I've had people that have plugged up their chimney completely with a six inch chimney and they've necked it down to a two inch hole in a matter of a week. Um, and there's two things that cause that. One, wet wood, you know, too much moisture in the wood and shutting it down right away, never getting it up to temperature. So, and you know, any modern stove is really designed to, uh, to be shut down. You know, it's, it's, they're designed to be closed off and burn, you know, for an extended period of time during the day or overnight. The problem is that people just do that all the time and never do get things up to temperature. So I usually recommend if you can twice a day, get that thing cranking. Um, usually in the morning, if, if you're burning it throughout the day, when it's coldest, you know, get it, get it really hot and cranking. Um, and then right before you go to bed, if you're gonna load it up and shut it down for the evening, you wanna get it really hot then too. And kind of the practice that I like to use that works really, really well, is say I'm getting ready to go, be go to bed, I got a kind of a bed of coals in there, maybe a couple little pieces burning. I'm gonna load up the stove as much as I can don't be afraid to, to really load it too. I mean, you can fill, fit as much wood in there as you can mm -hmm. and let all that new wood um, just go crazy for a good 10, 15 minutes. So you wanna make sure your bypass damper's open, your air control's in the fully open position and let all that new wood just really get cranking. What a lot of people will do because they already have a fire going in there is they'll throw that new wood in there and then just shut everything down immediately. And again, as we were just talking about, well, there's that drying phase and whatnot. And if you have a lot of big pieces of wood and you starve it of oxygen, it's gonna take a lot longer to actually break down and it'll result in, um, in typically an overnight burn that won't last as long uh, because the wood's not burning as thoroughly. It didn't get the chance to properly start breaking down. 
the goal is with all that new wood in there is you want to kind of complete that drying process first before you shut it down, right? Um, so that will increase the performance. Again, you'll get a longer burn time out of it. And then also through the night, you won't have as much buildup, you know, because you've completed that drying stage and you've gotten everything really, really hot too. So you've increased your food temperatures, your stove temperatures before you're shutting it down. So that's something that will really help. Um, but uh, going back to catalytic converters, um, catalytic converters are really designed to work at high temperatures. Um, there is some information out there saying that, and say, stating the opposite, but uh, through my experience and just hands-on working with them, and, and there's some research out, out there that supports this as well, is that catalytic converters really work at a certain temperature. They have to get up to 500 degrees before they actually start catalyzing, right? So the issue with that is that when you're loading up a stove and shutting it down overnight with a catalytic converter, well, over time, temperatures drop and drop and drop and lower and lower and lower, and they will drop below that 500 degree mark, and then your catalytic converter isn't working uh, like it should. So, um, so again, by really building that fire up before you shut things down, it'll superheat that catalytic converter and get it to a higher temperature so, so it'll sustain that temperature for a longer period of time. Um, in this particular stove, this is, this is what we call a hybrid stove. It has a combination of a catalytic converter and an air tube system inside of it as well, a secondary uh, air tube system. That secondary air tube system is bringing in constant air to the unit. It's not controlled by this. It's a constant flow of air. The purpose of that airflow is to help with reburning um, the smoke and, and you know the hydrocarbons and all that fuel that is getting released from the, from the wood. So what happens is as this wood is breaking down and it's releasing all those hydrocarbons uh, and fuel, it goes up against that baffle system gets mixed with all that extra oxygen that's coming in out of those air tubes and reignites. So like in a modern stove with a secondary air, air tube system in it, you're gonna actually see kind of almost two fires happening inside your stove. You're gonna see your primary fire down here and then up above you'll have like this rolling gas fire. And that's that emissions that normally would just be going up into the chimney actually reburning. The cool thing about that design is it's constant. It's happening whether you just started the fire, it's happening whether you've been having a fire going for eight hours, it's happening on high temperatures, low temperatures. So it's a really, I think, good design. And then coupled with a, a, a catalytic converter like this stove, um, it's called a hybrid because it's using both systems. Um, you're gonna you're gonna obtain your maximum efficiency that way. You're gonna get a lot of heat output, you're going to get really good emissions. That's why a lot of modern stoves have gone to this design to increase emissions, increase performance. Um, these Kumas are some of the highest BTU output stoves on the market for their size. Um, there's some that are higher, but when you compare size of firebox to BTU output, I wouldn't be surprised if Kuma was the top. Um, I haven't spent the time doing the research to actually look at every single brand and stove out there, but they really produce a good amount of heat. Um, and I think, I think a lot of that is just the design, the baffle system, secondary air tubes, and that catalytic converter in there. I've burned the old version of this stove in my house, which did not have a catalytic converter in it, and I've burned this new one in my house. And comparing them side by side, with that catalytic converter, you certainly get more heat, more efficiency, it's cleaner burning. There's a lot of, a, a lot of added benefit that catalytic converter adds. The thing about it, again, is they only work at high temperatures, right? So this, this bypass damper, the way that works is there's a baffle system in there. It could be a stainless steel plate, it could be fire brick, it could be a combination of the two. Sometimes there's a ceramic fiber insulated blanket on top of the baffle system. Uh, there's lots of different designs out there. This particular one has a stainless steel plate with an insulated blanket on top of it. Um, and so what happens is when the fire is burning, it goes up against that plate, it has to come to the front of the stove, around the top of that plate, around the top of the stove, to the back of the stove, and then up and out. So it kind of has like this snaky pathway that it has to go around. That's really common of a modern wood stove. 
Um, the purposes of that is to get more heat retention, more, more efficiency out of the unit. So you have a long heat extraction process. Uh, it also helps with emissions as well. Um, and your catalytic converter is positioned right above that baffle system. So what the bypass damper does, uh, and not all stoves have this, but any, any stove with a catalytic converter is going to have this. When it's in the open position, it's gonna open up an opening or a hole in that baffle system, in that plate system that goes directly into the chimney. So what it's doing is bypassing your reburn system and that catalytic converter. The purpose of that is for easier starting because then you're getting that heat directly into that chimney, you know, into, into your flue, so, so it heats up a lot quick, quicker, gets the draft established quicker. It also gives you time to heat up your catalytic converter before putting the majority of the smoke through it, right? So um, any modern stove catalytic converter is required to have some type of thermostat or probe on it. And this particular stove, it's not really a thermostat, it doesn't have degrees on it, it's just kind of like a probe. And so there's this range here, there's this active range with, with kind of a, a little um, lined, uh, striped um, entry, in, entry point. And then there's two little lines here, little divots. And that first little line is kind of your, it's in the active range, good one. It's in the active range and it's up to temperature and you can close it down. Now, I like to, and that's the minimum. 500 degrees is kind of like the minimum, right? I like to go above the minimum. I want, I want things to be really hot. I want things to be running at optimum efficiency. I want to pr be producing as little <coughs> buildup in the system as possible. So I wait until that little red needle gets to about 12 o'clock, until it's nice and vertical before I'm gonna close this. So, um, and to do that, again, we go through this process of tending the fire and, and waiting until these smaller pieces burn down. We're starting to actually get some really good coals in there. I'm going to grab another couple of pieces. We're gonna move those around, get some bigger pieces of wood in there, and probably once I get these bigger pieces of wood in there, after a few minutes, then we're really going to start, start, to, start to see a jump in temperature. <clears throat> um, yeah. So whenever we're loading the fire, um, if you've been burning a little while, your bypass damper is closed, your air control might be closed, it's a good practice to open those before you open the door. On a lot of stoves, if your bypass damper is closed and you go to open your door, you're most likely going to get a face full of smoke. Um, that's another feature of the bypass damper, is it, it instead of all the smoke getting pushed towards the front of the stove, it actually sucks it up the back. So it, it, it helps prevent smoke from coming out the front. Um, on some stoves that have a really big opening, a really big door, it's still not uncommon, even with the bypass damper, to get a little bit of smoke spillage out the front because the size of that opening. Um, so really, you really have to pay attention to when you're loading and how you're loading. It's really important to have a properly sized venting system and a, and a, and a height on that venting system that's appropriate for that appliance. So that's something that we always look at when we're looking at installing a particular product. Are we gonna have the right size system and is it gonna be tall enough to ensure that the unit's gonna work at its top performance? Okay. Another thing that I like to do is kind of crack the door and let the, the um, let everything kind of just stabilize inside the stove. If you open it too quick, you could get a little bit of puff back. It's not too uncommon, so you, I kind of leave it open, leave it cracked. Certainly don't need to leave it cracked this long. It really just takes, you know, maybe 30 seconds or something like that. And then slowly open the door to prevent smoke from coming out into the room. So what I'm gonna do is reach in here. I'm gonna take those pieces that were kind of in uh, crisscross there. I'm gonna kind of drop, drop them down a little bit. Yeah, it did get a little toasty. Okay, we're gonna see if we can get this guy. Okay, and you can hear that draft. You can hear that suction going. Right, that's what you want. That's a good thing. 
And we've got a, a decently tall chimney here, so the draft gets going pretty darn good in this thing. I don't know the exact height, but I want to say it's pretty close to 18 feet. So. Is it completely straight all the way through? It is. Mm -hmm. Yep. All right, so that would start the catch. I'm going to go ahead and close that door. Um, so the, the amount of time it takes to get the new wood going, uh, once you get that really good coal base going, obviously takes takes less time because things are hotter. You got more of those coals in there. So. All right, so now we're just going to wait until that needle kind of hits the midpoint. Once that happens, we can go ahead and close our bypass damper. Depending on the temperature inside your home, like if your home isn't heated up yet, it's still kind of chilly, and you want to get some heat to the far corners of your house, leave your air control open. Leave it open. Let that thing cook. Let that thing produce heat until you get your home to the temperature that's comfortable. So many people, what they will do is, as soon as they close the bypass damper, they'll shut the stove down too. And then they'll complain about how the stove doesn't put out enough heat, they don't get their house heated up and so on and so forth. <coughs> if you're not heating up your house, if you're too cold in some parts of your house, let it continue to burn in the open position. Get your house up to temperature first and then start closing it down. Yes, it's gonna burn more wood with it open, but you're actually then gonna be able to heat your house and be at a temperature you're comfortable with, right? So, um, yep. Uh, but if you've reached the temperature, like the stove in my house is overkill. So as soon as I got it up to temperature and I, I closed my bypass damper, I would usually shut my air control down about halfway. I wouldn't shut it all the way, but I would at least slow that burning process because I've got about a thousand square foot house and it's reasonably insulated and this is a pretty big unit. It really wouldn't take much to heat our house. I mean, be, you know, up to 80 degrees in 15, 20 minutes in there. So um, anyways, so that is building a fire. Do you recommend that 